Mary Wollstonecraft is a prominent political philosopher and feminist. She is considered as a founder of modern feminism, and she famously wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women. But before we get into her work, let's get to know a little bit about Wollstonecraft's life. Wollstonecraft was born in London on the 27th of April in 1759 to Edward John and Elizabeth. She has three brothers and two sisters. In the memoirs her husband William Godwin published in 1798 following her death, he stated that her father was a drunk, short-tempered, and abusive man. Her mother, too, was difficult. Wollstonecraft's childhood was also unstable. They moved numerous times as their father tried to establish himself as a farmer, which caused them to suffer financially. She also had a chaotic education, but that was not unusual for a female during her time. By the age of 16... She formed a significant friendship with an accomplished and talented woman named Frances Blood. Blood was also interested in education, and by spending more time with her, Wollstonecraft wanted to be independent and move out of her home. So, by the age of 19, she became a companion to a Mrs. Dowson, despite being told that she had a temper. Wollstonecraft lived with Mrs. Dowson for two years until she moved to take care of her ill mother, who passed away in 1780. In 1782, she also moved in with her sister Eliza, took care of her, and helped her get out of a terrible marriage. In 1783, Wollstonecraft opened up a school with her two sisters and Frances Blood. After Blood's death, Wollstonecraft closed down the school and became a governess to a family. Then she became an author and was recognized by the public. Her first book was Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, which was published in 1789. In 1790, she published A Vindication of the Rights of Men in response to Edmund Burke's opposition to the French Revolution. After she fought for the rights of men, she decided to fight for the rights of women and published A Vindication of the Rights of Women two years later. Let's take a look at the social context in which A Vindication of the Rights of Women was published. Wollstonecraft published this book because women held an inferior status to men during that time, and she argued that both sexes are naturally born equal. She was inspired by the French Revolution, where French women petitioned to the National Assembly to receive equality. They demanded economic emancipation and stressed the importance of education. She even dedicated the book to M. Talleyrand Perigord, who argued that women should remain devoted to their domestic duties. So, he was against education and women's participation in the public sphere. So, what was happening in Britain? In the 1790s to 1860s, Britain was marked by heavy discussions regarding women's rights and social standing. While women such as Wollstonecraft were demanding equality of the sexes, other conservative women such as Hannah More believed that women should be concerned with domestic affairs. Wollstonecraft's opinions at that time were not that very popular, and the women's movement was very fragmented. Because ideas regarding gender and the abilities that they were born with were very prominent. Enlightenment thinkers believed in natural equality, however they emphasized differences between the sexes. Distinctions between men and women were made, where men were seen as rational, strong, temperate, and mature. On the other hand, women were inherently irrational, weak, emotional, impulsive, and naive. In addition, there was a link between a woman's physical size or strength in comparison to men, where because she is smaller and weaker, she is inferior to a man and exhibits different characteristics, often associated with children. Social contract theorist Jean-Jacques Rousseau published Emile, or the Treatise on Education in 1762, 
where he stated that there is a perfect man and there is a perfect woman. And the perfect man and perfect woman are not alike because women and men are naturally different due to their sex. Rousseau argued that women are specifically made for a man's delight and that the stronger sex, which is the man, should rule over women. Due to the natural differences between the two sexes, Rousseau believed that girls' educations should be relative to men, where they learn how to please, to be useful, to care for, and console them. This idea of females' inherent inferiority was shared across Britain during that time. For instance, women had conduct manuals that dictated how they must behave, their household duties, and other instructions regarding social etiquette and domestic affairs. So, as you can see, women were directly associated with housework, which also meant that their education was in fact relative to men, because it was limited to domestic affairs. This is related to another commonly shared belief that women need to be controlled and managed because they are inherently more lustful than men. This idea stems from Eve being the main culprit in eating from the tree of knowledge. Looking at Rousseau's Emile, he stressed the importance of subjecting girls to constraint and severe restraint to continuously interrupt them which he sees as a woman's key to socialization. What Rousseau basically means is that even when you are going to be limiting women to the private sphere, they shouldn't be enjoying what they want all the time. They need to learn and understand that they are there for men. And so when you see them doing something they enjoy, you can interrupt them. So they have to put down what they want to do for themselves and be useful to you. This obviously infuriated Wollstonecraft and she published A Vindication of the Rights of Women. This book had several purposes, all of which fell under the advocation for women's rights. Her book is divided into 13 chapters where she discusses several themes such as God and religion, modesty, marriage, reputation, parenthood, sexuality, and she addresses Dr. Fordyce and Gregory. She mainly argues for women's education as well as against the oppressive ideas about women's inherent nature, conduct manuals, and religious oppression. In doing so, she famously critiqued Enlightenment philosopher Rousseau for his views regarding women, their place in society, and their education. For today's purposes, we will be focusing on her refutation of commonly shared beliefs that are reiterated by Rousseau regarding a woman's natural place and ability. Wollstonecraft argues that both sexes are fundamentally equal. She makes it very clear in her introduction that she is arguing that women are creatures of reason just like men. Their sex does not determine their characteristics or intellectual capabilities. She says, my sex, I hope, will excuse me if I treat them like rational creatures, instead of flattering their fascinating graces and viewing them as if they were in a state of perpetual childhood. In this statement, Wollstonecraft addresses women, asking them to forgive her for treating them as equal and rational human beings, rather than seeing them as children. This statement touches on an important point. And it gives us an insight into how women were treated during that time. It lets us know that women were treated like children, and therefore they were given rights of a child. But it also lets us know that women accepted that role and viewed each other as children. In chapter 1, she prefaces her arguments by discussing virtue as something that both sexes are capable of achieving. However, it can only be achieved through knowledge. She also says that this virtue is central to creating a civilization. Hence, she critiques Rousseau's admiration of the savage and goes further to say that his ideas of the state of nature are unsound. By critiquing his idea of the state of nature, she then critiques his ideas about sectors. 
And this is because Rousseau bases his arguments about the differences between women and men on nature, whereas Wollstonecraft takes a stand against his arguments and uses reason as her foundation. She also states that having men such as Rousseau discuss women's education created an unrealistic image of women's weakness. Wollstonecraft also states that having men such as Rousseau discuss women's education created an unrealistic image of women's weakness. She is allowing the readers to know and address the fact that men are creating the narrative about what women are, who they are, and what they can be. She refutes his ideas that being physically stronger makes men superior to women, as well as his claims that women naturally enjoy activities in which they are attentive to others. In the following chapters, Wollstonecraft states that virtue is not exclusive to one sex. Being born a man as opposed to a woman does not give you the characteristics that allow you to achieve virtue. She argues that women are purposely raised to accept ignorance as their nature. As a result, they are kept from obtaining virtue. She goes on to point the finger at men who complain about a woman's foolishness, stating that they are reinforcing societal structures in which women are taught to act foolishly to be protected by men. Women are not foolish by nature, Wollstonecraft says, but they are taught to be in a state of childhood, making them dependent on men and easier to control. She argues that men and women should have equal education that reflects the opinions and manners of society, which will allow them to sharpen their senses and think independently. She discusses how society sculpted women into focusing on sensation, such as novels and music, and that this focus weakens a woman's reason. Thus, it lays the foundation for making women think like children. Society also emphasizes a woman's appearance or loveliness. It creates shallow, ignorant, and dependent women, which is degrading as well because they are not expected to make any efforts in life. She also argues that the constant surveillance and regulation of a woman's behavior imply that women cannot be trusted to think for themselves and make their own decisions. Instead of being treated as equals, they are treated like children. She states that her goal is to show people that elegance is inferior to virtue. Wollstonecraft believes that men think it's necessary to regulate women's behavior because they see them as inherently flawed. She challenges this idea by saying men are more under the influence of their appetites than women. She also refers to Rousseau's views on women as male-centered and says that his usage of nature to justify limiting women's rights and emancipation is flawed because he overlooks external factors, meaning societal ones, which cause and encourage women to accept ignorance, vanity, and childishness as certain female characteristics. She discusses this as something women have been trained to do. However, it is not natural to program an entire gender to give up their reason and the achievement of virtue. This, according to Wollstonecraft, is because many men like Rousseau see that having a young woman without any mind is very pleasing. That said, Wollstonecraft sees that the natural distinctions between men and women are actually unnatural. Instead, they are socially constructed and reinforced by the patriarchal societal structure in order to keep women under control. She argues that society is not well organized and to achieve a well-organized society in which men and women help themselves and can achieve greatness together, she encourages equal education for both genders, reminding readers that women's faults are due to the lack of education, which has been imposed on them by society. Moreover, Wollstonecraft says that not only is encouraging women to be ignorant degrading, but it is bad for society as a whole because women make up half of it 
Having half of society become enslaved to their bodies rather than their mind is dangerous to civilization. She asks questions regarding self-growth, as well as educating future generations, going to heaven, and marriage in regards to education.